Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory, O oh God. We give you all the honor, O oh God. And Father, you are saying in your word, the Lord, if my people, but my name will humble themselves, Lord, and pray and seek your face, O oh God, and turn away from their wicked ways, O oh God. You will hear them from heaven, O oh God, and you will heal their land, O oh God. And Father, we ask you, O oh God, to come, O oh God, and just heal our land, O oh God. Oh, 
Unaweza Unaweza mokosi Unaweza Unaweza mokosi Unaweza Unaweza mokosi One time Unaweza
Let's raise up your voice and call in the name of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Let's call up 
upon his name glorify his name we thank you Jesus we thank you Lord So it is yet another time that we are gathered before the presence of the Lord that we as the Christ ambassadors of KAG Bahati want to take this opportunity to invite you and welcome you to our youth service. So karibu sana, karibu sana. May God minister to you, may he richly bless you as we are going through the book of Luke. May he come and minister to us. So let's pray on behalf of the speaker. Our Father and our God, in Jesus' name we come before you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We bless you, Lord, because you have been good to us, O oh God. We pray, Father Lord, as the speaker comes and he speaks unto us, O oh Lord, may we receive the word that you've placed in his mouth on behalf of our souls, O oh God. We pray, Father Lord, that you will minister to us. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray, trusting and believing. Amen. We welcome you to our youth Bible study. And we've been going through the book of Luke and how and impactful it has been to our lives. And I pray that it has to your life as well. Last week we saw Luke chapter 7 from verse 1 to 17. And we saw how Jesus Christ was impressed by the faith of the centurion. He was a Gentile. Yet Jesus was so impressed by his faith because of his humility that this man came to Jesus and would stoop down and not consider Jesus a Jew. And although he was a Roman, he went to him for help, not for his own sake, but for the sake of his servant. And he believed that Jesus was not just able to heal his servant, that Jesus, by the power of his word, that he didn't have to come and touch his servant, but that just by speaking, his word would be effectual. And then we saw that Jesus and his company, as they were going into the city, the town of Nain, they met another company that was going to bury a son of a widow. And Jesus, out of compassion, raised the son from the dead. And here we see the power of Jesus Christ but most importantly, we see the compassion of Jesus. And we see what touches the heart of Jesus. Humility, faith, and compassion. And today I'd just like to take a look at uh, the rest of the chapter from verse 18 to verse 50. That's Luke 7, 18 to verse 50. And I, I, I'd call my theme as, are you offended because of Jesus Christ? We'll take a look at it, starting from verse 18 to verse 35, and it says, Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things, and John, calling to two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John the Baptist had been one prophet who came to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. In the end of 
Malachi chapter 4, God promised his people that he would send someone in the spirit of Elijah so that he would knit and repair the relationships between the father and their children and children to their fathers before God came. And we see that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of that prophecy when he came to prepare the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, after some time, because of the message he was preaching, that was so full of repentance, he once rebuked, I believe it was Philip, the governor. And he told Philip and rebuked him by taking one of his brother's wife and taking him. And John the Baptist rebuked him. And for this reason, he was thrown into prison. And there in prison, he received reports that Jesus, his cousin, was doing great, that his ministry was expanding, that he was healing the sick, that he was raising the dead. His ministry was flourishing, and yet he was in prison. Don't we find ourselves in such situations that all around we can see God is moving, God is working, yet in our lives we are imprisoned. There's nothing happening in our lives. Or we are in, we are in a fix. We are in trial. We are in tribulation. Yet all around us we can hear testimonies of people who are moving forward by God's strength. And so John the Baptist went to Jesus and asked his disciples to go to Jesus to him and ask him, are you the coming one or should we look for another? You see, the ministry of Jesus also involved freeing the captives and letting the prisoners go free. And so John the Baptist, who knew what the ministry of Jesus involved, asked Jesus, why? Why am I still in prison and yet you came to let the prisoners go free? And so when they came to Jesus, Jesus fulfilled the scriptures right here. It actually comes from Isaiah 35, from verse 5, and it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Jesus fulfilled that by doing those miracles there and then. And then he said, as they were leaving, he told the disciples to tell John, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We can find offense because of what Jesus does or because of how God is moving. Because he's not moving the way we think, the way we perceived, the way we had hoped. Jesus, God, moves and has his own ways and his own plans for our lives. So my prayer to you is that although we may not understand Although we may not figure it out why, we are, why things are so tough, God is there. It is in seasons of trials and pain that this question surfaces. I can just picture John there in the prison, all alone, with ample time, or all the time, to think. And he would ask himself these questions because from birth he was separated for the ministry, and yet now here he was in prison for something that was right. He had done no wrong. He was there because he had spoken the truth to Herod. And Jesus comforted John the Baptist and told him, please do not be offended because of me. You see, God is not answerable to us for the things that he does. God does not give us a reason or an answer of the difficulty that we go through. But this he has promised is that all things will work together for good. When we don't understand why life is so tough, when you don't understand why things are getting so thick, one thing we can rest on is that God is working together all things for good. And we find this in Romans 8:28, 28, 
where it says that, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. All things. It has to be all things. You cannot take them apart. That this thing leads to this thing, this thing leads to this thing. No, God works it all. Works it all for good. And this thing we know. And I don't know, like me, you've asked yourself, how did they know? We can say we know because it's written in the scriptures, but when Paul was writing to the Romans, they didn't have the New Testament. But he told them, this we know, this they knew, because there was something in the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross that Paul was able to say, if Jesus went through that for you, then there is no pain that he will allow in your life that he won't work it for good. Because it was on the cross that we see that even evil was worked out for good. Because when Satan thought that he had won, it was the same cross that he was crucified in. Because Jesus rose from the dead and it is his blood that was shed on the cross that now redeems us and gives us freedom. That makes us the sons and daughters of God that makes us part of the family of God. All things work together for good. And also we know that the things that we go through, they achieve in us an eternal weight of glory. That's in Romans 8 verse 18, where Paul says that, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. That the, the things that we go through that are tough right now, trials and tribulations, those things, they cannot be compared to the glory that God will give us. The tests do not, will never compare to the reward of passing the test. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, he says that this moment, momentary and temporary tribulations, they are achieving in us an eternal weight of glory. They make our lives meaningful. They make our lives deep. I don't know if you've seated uh, or you have uh, been with someone who has gone through a lot, yet has kept the faith. They have a depth in God. They have a depth in their life. Their life is not trite. See to kuamka kun when the job, that circle, no, they have a depth. Because it is these tough times that give us the depth. Hebrews chapter 5 tells us that Jesus himself, although he was the son of God, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. But one thing I want to pass across is this, is that God does not lead us into tough times because he is mean. The Bible tells us that God is good. God is good. That is the foundational principle that you should always remember, that God is good. And anything that he brings into your life, just remember that his character is the same, that he is good. And you can rely on that. Because Revelation 19 verse 2 says that all the judgments of God, they are righteous and true. And one day, we shall understand them. One day, we shall be able to connect the dots. When we look back, we are told that hindsight is twenty twenty. That when we look back, we shall see clearly that Kumbe, this was what God was working through in my life. And that's why I had to pass through these things. And so John the Baptist, for him, that was the, that was the case. That he was in prison because God had purposed it for him. But Jesus turned quickly when the disciples had left and he began to praise John and he said from verse 24, when the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? 
Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Isn't it so like Jesus that once he rebukes us, we don't know what he does. But I can just picture that behind John's back, Jesus was blessing him and he was speaking well of John the Baptist. And that is what God does to us as well. Sometimes we may think that God is mad at us because he's correcting us. But actually he is proud of us. Job is a very good example that when Job was asking questions, God, why? Why have you allowed my kids to die? Why have you allowed my property to be taken? I have nothing. Sickness is in me. Job was asking a lot of questions. Why is it this so and I have not sinned? God, explain yourself. God came and he asked Job really hard questions from chapter 38, 39 and chapter 40. God asked really tough questions. And in that you can think that God was angry with Job, yet God was elated with Job because the one thing that was in, on contention, Job had kept the faith. You see, the challenge in Job was that he was to curse God and to deny God. That was the, the challenge between Satan and God. And Job did not curse God. He had questions, but he did not curse God. And so he had kept the faith. He had passed the test. And so the same thing we see here in, with John. It's okay to have questions, but one thing is important, that we are never to lose our faith in God. And you see, John was the greatest prophet to ever live in the Old Testament. Imagine, greater than Abraham, than Samuel, than Daniel, than Elijah, than Elisha. This is Jesus himself saying that there is no one born of women that is greater prophet than John the Baptist. Why? The reason we are told is in John chapter 10, verse 40, it says, And he went away again beyond the Jordan, this is Jesus, to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. That although John did not raise the dead, John did not call out fire from heaven, one thing John did, John spoke about Jesus Christ. And the people said that he has not done any miracle, yes, but everything he has said about Jesus is true. And so many people believed in Jesus because of that. John was just a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And that is why he was great, because he spoke of Jesus Christ. That is how we become great as well. When we go about our lives, in our schools, in our jobs, at home, with our friends, when we go about speaking about Jesus Christ, that is a task you and I can do. That is a calling you and I can fulfill. We can go about speaking about Jesus Christ. I love what Acts says that the early disciples, the early church, they went about gossiping about Jesus Christ, telling people about Jesus Christ. And that is our calling. And so after this, the people who had been baptized by John the Baptist, they were excited because of the rubber stamp that Jesus had given to John's ministry. But the Pharisees who had not been baptized they were offended. So this is the second Lord who found offense in Jesus Christ. They found offense because they did not believe in the message that Jesus was passing across. They did not believe that John was actually sent by God, that he was Elijah in the spirit. But the tax collectors and the sinners, uh, the word sinners here used, does not mean those who are doing sin, but in those times a sinner was someone who had 
had been fed up with trying to live all the commandments of the law. There were 613 commandments from Genesis to Deuteronomy. 613. And some people just said, I, I can't keep it. I'll keep some, but I can't keep them all. And they were called sinners because of that. Because they were not trying to achieve righteousness by the law. And these people, when they heard John's message of repentance and coming to God and preparing the way and being baptized, they readily accepted the message and they were baptized. And when Jesus said that John's ministry was true and it was from God, they were excited. But the Pharisees who are still trying to achieve their own righteousness, trying with their own efforts to please God, they were left out. Are we offended because of the message of Jesus Christ? Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is exclusive. There is no other way. Acts chapter 4 says that now there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved apart from that name, Jesus. You see, when we find offense in Jesus Christ, we tend to be hardened in our hearts because we can never accept any message that comes from him. Jesus gives us an illustration and says, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Whether the message be comforting and encouraging, or it be piercing and dividing, we will never accept the message as long as our hearts are hardened. But Jesus said that wisdom is justified by her children, that the results of the message of God, the results speak for themselves. Because Jesus said that, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. God's word makes us wise to salvation, that we may live lives that matter, lives that count. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and doing it. Foolishness is wasting away your life by not doing what is right. And so we need to pay attention to our hearts. Every time we hear God's word, do we allow it in our hearts? Or do we build walls? Or do we think them through and evaluate them with the wisdom of the world? Jesus would have us know that God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That we are just to place our faith in his word. All things are possible unto them that believe. And so we live there. Jesus, after speaking these words, he was invited by Simon into a feast, into a dinner. Simon was a Pharisee. And the Bible tells us in verse 36, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Remember, a sinner is someone who has been tired of trying to keep the law, the entirety of the law, 613 commandments in all, and is just living life, keeping those that they can and not, not trying by their own efforts. They're, they're just fed up. So we are told that this woman who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. We see her desperation. This woman 
came with everything, with everything that she had. The alabaster flask of oil, this was the, the savings account, I might say, in those times, that they would buy something precious and, you, and, and save up the money and then buy something precious to store it as funds. Yet she gave it all to Jesus Christ. She used her hair. The Bible says that the hair is the glory of a woman, something precious to her, her hair. And she used it to wash the feet of Jesus. And she used her tears to wipe Jesus' feet. Because she knew that in Jesus Christ, she was able to find the thing that she longed for. And that was forgiveness. You see, these miracles were great that Jesus was doing. Raising the dead, healing the leprous, healing the sick, walking on water. These were really great miracles. But there's no miracle that, is, that compares to having your sins forgiven. Having your sins forgiven. That is the greatest miracle. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, the word of God says that we who are dead in sin and trespasses have been quickened, have been made alive by God because of his immense mercies. And so she went to Jesus Christ poured out herself, gave everything. She was not ashamed or embarrassed. All she wanted is to know that she would be forgiven. That is what she went for. Yet Simon thought in, in his heart, if Jesus is indeed a prophet, he should have known what kind of woman she was. But one thing about God, or one thing about Jesus is that Jesus always knows what the questions in our hearts, even before we ask them, he knows them. And so Jesus gives, gives Simon a story and says, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. You see, the story that Jesus gives is one in which there were two debtors. One had really great debt, 500 denarii or 500 uh, salaries of a working day, and the other was 50. And none of them was able to pay. That's one thing you need to realize is that we all have a debt to pay. Because of our sins, we have been indebted to God. We have sold ourselves to evil and to sin and to the kingdom of Satan because we have allowed him to use our lives by rebelling against God's laws. And so it doesn't matter whether you're trying to be good or you've given yourself to be evil. One thing is there, is that we are all in debt. But I thank God that Jesus is called our kinsman redeemer. He came to buy us back in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. It says from verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy from God. That we were once not a people, but we are now the people of God. God has made us into, to be part of his family. John says in John 1 verse 12 that yet to them that believed he gave them the right to be called children of God. But there was a debt to be paid and Jesus paid it. 
Peter says that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, not by perishable things like gold and silver. And so you and I, no matter our state, Jesus has paid the price for all of us. But it is them that are more sick, it is them that are more sinful once they are forgiven. To them that are forgiven much, they love much. And we have been forgiven much. I'm not saying that you go out and do everything that you want. Just sit down and realize how much you have been forgiven and you will appreciate God's love. And you will appreciate what Jesus did for you on the cross. And this woman gave to Jesus what Simon, the host, did not give. He washed Jesus' feet. He anointed him with oil and he gave him a kiss, which was customary at those times when you would receive a guest. You would give them a kiss on the cheek to invite them in as a greeting. You would wash their feet because they were walking with sandals and they would get dirty. And you would anoint them with oil to freshen them up. And this woman did that for Jesus. And Jesus, I can just imagine the, the, the delight that was in, in her heart when she heard these words, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We can hear those words this day as well. Because in Jesus we have the forgiveness of sins. He is our savior. That is what the name Jesus means. That Yahweh is our salvation. To save us from sins. To wash us and to wash them away. And to take them away. Hebrews says that he paid for our sins once and for all. We know that our medicine is working because when you take it, you get better and one day you will no longer need it. And that is the case with a faith in Jesus Christ that he takes our sins away and we are able to live the life that God has intended for us. The righteous life, the right life, not by our own strength, but God gives us his spirit that we may live as he tells us, as he whispers in our hearts, as he prompts us to move a certain direction, to do a certain thing, as he gives us the grace by which we stand so that we may walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, for his reputation, because we are his children. And so I finish with a question. Here the Pharisees were offended because Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And they said, who is this who forgives sins but God? You see, only God can forgive sins. Sin is something we do wrong against God and against God alone. So no human being has the right Yet Jesus was not a human being. He was perfect God, 100% God and 100% man. And so in him, he could perfectly forgive our sins. For the word says that in him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in Jesus Christ, we have all that we need. And so my call to you this time is to come to Jesus and to come to him over and over and over to keep on coming. God created the world in such a way the first thing that he did was to separate day and night and I think that is how he wants our lives to be lived. A day at a time, a day at a time, a day at a time. In Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 4 we are told, coming to him as to a living stone Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices 
acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. That Jesus is called the rock, the rock of ages. But what you do of him will determine whether he will be your stepping stone or your stumbling stone. That is our part. Our response to Jesus is important. God does not call us to try to strive and attain to where he is, but what he calls us into question is whether we will receive the gift of grace, the gift of his love, the gift of forgiveness, whether we would receive it graciously, whether we would accept it, whether we would take it into heart. We are not called to strive to attain to God, but we are called to be responsive. May you be responsive to God's voice and God's word. Let us pray. And Father, we thank you for your word this day. We thank you that, Lord, indeed you are interested and you are moved. And Lord, you go and you went to them that were sinners. Lord Jesus, you went to them that were outcasts and misfits. And Lord, sometimes we feel that we are those people. But we thank you that, Lord, indeed, when you died for us and you rose again, Lord, now we have access to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help us in time of need. May you help us, Lord Jesus, not to be offended by you, not to be offended when you move in our lives and you allow things that, Lord, are trying and are difficult. But, Lord, this day we just put our faith in you, knowing that all things work together for good. And, Lord, we know that in you we have everything that we need. We thank you that you have taken away our sins. We thank you that you have forgiven us. We pray, O oh Lord, that we may stand firm in you, O oh God. And may you help us, Lord, to be them that receive your word with grace, that receive your word with an open heart, so that we may be blessed by it, that we may be corrected, rebuked, encouraged, and trained in righteousness, that we may be ready for any good work. We thank you and we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Okay, God bless you. We pray that this word has ministered unto you. And I pray that God's word would take root in your heart and flourish in you. Because his word is sweeter than honey. His word causes us to be strong. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for our service. I'm glad that you have been part of our service today. So I just want to encourage you that we just keep into the word. And the word is the life of us. So we want to pray because of the sermon. Thank you God because of your word. We bless you because you have ministered unto us. How we pray that my God and my Father, even for the week that is about to start, my God, that you will minister to your people. You will keep them. You will enable them to succeed wherever they need to succeed, oh God. We bless you because of that. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray, trusting, and believing. Amen. And again, guys, don't forget to subscribe to our social media platforms. We are on YouTube and Facebook. So kindly click the button. And so that you can get updates and updates. Now, sister, how the churches are open. Kwevo karibu sana for the services. We have four services. Don't forget, church is open. So karibu sana. Blessings. Amen.
Nikiwa karibu Wewe ndiwe Mfariji wangu Wa milele, wa milele, wa milele, wa 